Proteins are little nanobots that do all sorts of things inside of your cells. They carry signals, copy DNA, ensure your arms grow where they're supposed to, and much more. The blueprint for these complex 3D nanobots are conveniently stored in the DNA using a very clever system. Read letters of DNA and code what flavor of amino acid will be added to the protein. And the properties of these amino acids dictate what shape and function the protein will take on. It's simple, clever, and elegant. The only problem is, there are countless ways in which this can go wrong. The consequences of being wrong? Cystic fibrosis, the mad cow disease, and all sorts of neurodegenerative disorders. All diseases that have a heavy impact on the livelihoods of the victims. This is the science behind the clever machinery of protein folding. How does a given blueprint know how to assemble itself? The answer to that is forces. These forces are encoded within the flavor of amino acid within the side chain. Specifically, charges, polarity, the hydrophobic van der Waals, the quantum mechanical covalent bonds, and so on. These side chains with different forces interact with one another to form a 3D structure. The interactions aren't limited within the chain. Basically, anything that can have a mechanical impact will have a mechanical impact on the protein. The polar, watery environment of the cells drives everything hydrophobic inside. Other proteins surrounding it can give interesting forces that change the shape of the protein. The temperature can make things more shaky and so much more. Take a look at these two sequences of protein. There is only one difference in the letters. One has glutamine and one has lysine. And it's this subtle difference that turns normal red blood cells into sickle cell disease. The way proteins fold can be represented by the energy funnel. The lower the energy, the more stable the structure is. But sometimes, though, the protein can get stuck in one of these little wells that aren't as deep, but they require a bit of a boost to get out of. And other times, they're going in a completely wrong direction and become nasty misfolded messes that can lead to diseases. The biggest problem is when a protein is unfolded, its protein sequence can adopt over 10 to the 30 different conformations and it would take millions of years for the protein to search until it finds the right one. Because ultimately, there is only one correct 3D structure for a given protein. But if there are that many ways to go wrong, then why aren't we all sick? Why are all of our proteins ready for production, even though on paper it would take millions of years to find the right shape? How does the cell help the protein fold properly? But how do scientists come up with these numbers from life science-based phenomena? Luckily, the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org, has a unique and powerful way to help you get started on that. Brilliant is where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. The interactives on Brilliant help you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not just memorization, which will help you own the knowledge you've obtained. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data. If you want to deeply understand science and come up with the conclusions found in this video, learning data science would be a great start, especially when you want to understand the algorithms behind protein folding related AI, such as AlphaFold. These courses are perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis. With a fully built out suite of new content from Bayes theorem to multiple linear regressions. You'll also learn how to parse and visualize massive data sets to make them easier to interpret. Beyond that, you'll also gain real-world insight by working with real datasets from sources such as Starbucks, X, Spotify, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms or click on the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. To answer all of that, we're going to have to open up the hood of the cell and see how it goes from DNA blueprints to protein robots. First, the DNA gets transcribed into RNA, then RNA gets translated into proteins using ribosomes. 
every three letters of RNA gets read into one amino acid, and they are then linked together to form a protein chain. The essence of getting it to fold into the right shape is to restrict the possibilities of folding. In fact, you're about to see it happen right now in this animation. As the protein is getting synthesized, it has to go through a tube in the ribosome. The tube itself prevents the small chain of amino acids from exploring all the possible conformations. And by doing so, it forces the small chain to only explore a small number of shapes, which can, in some cases, allow the formation of alpha helices. Restricting the number of possibilities is the major driver behind the folding funnel, but the tube is too narrow to allow a protein to adopt a more complex structure, and eventually the protein has to exit the tube when it gets longer. But that is only the beginning. The cells can actually do much more beyond that. In fact, these mechanisms were actually discovered accidentally. So the heat shock response was discovered a little bit by chance. Scientists were studying the fruit fly, which are tiny little flies, using different incubators. And by mistake, they set some of these incubators at a higher temperature. And when they were incubating the fly at the higher temperature, what they realized is that they were turning on a transcription response, the heat shock response, where many genes now were specifically transcribed only at the elevated temperature. And later on, when we study the function of these genes, what we discover is that they were encoding chaperone proteins that were there in the cells to help increasing the folding capacities when the temperature was increased. In hindsight, this is a pretty logical place to find things that help proteins fold. If you recall, temperature can make things a lot more shaky and can disrupt the protein structure. So the cell has to send all these first responders to do damage control. These chaperones functions all have one thing in common. They lead to restricting the possible shapes of the protein when they interact with their client. Here's a fun example. A protein is for sure misfolded if the hydrophobic sides are exposed in a cell composed of mostly water. The HSP40 chaperone detects these and brings it to HSP70. HSP70 then holds onto one of these hydrophobic regions. Let's say this protein has three hydrophobic regions. All three would be able to interact with one another, but if we have HSP70 bound on A, then only B and C can interact, followed by A after its release. In fact, one of Dr. Mayer's research found another function of HSP40. So in many genetic diseases, one of the issue can be that a single mutation uh, can induce a bit of misfolding. So this is our, what we call the Y-type proteins. It has all its sequence. And then here we have a mutant proteins that just have one little change. Now that little change is going to change the shape of our proteins. So normally the cells can recognize that. And what it will do, it would simply degrade that misfolded proteins thanks to the ubiquitin polysome system. Now, chaperones uh, that normally functions in helping the folding of these uh, proteins can also have additional function in the cells, and they can be used as buffering agent. So one of the chaperones that we study, DNAAJ2, what it does is actually put a break, and it prevents that fast degradation on the cells by helping the misfolded proteins to try to go back to its normal shape. Even cooler still, the cell can literally put the misfolded proteins in jail, known as the trick chaperonin complex, and force it to fold again in the proper environment. Talk about a correctional facility, don't you think? If all else fails, the proteins are tagged using ubiquitin and guided to a literal protein shredder. The danger of wrong protein shape really is that extreme. But it begs the question, if the system works as well as I have said, why do protein folding diseases still happen? Well, as you grow older, your cells can start to accumulate more and more mutations and simply make more errors when making proteins that can also amass more damages such as oxidation. These mutations can get to the point where ubiquitin and chaperones can't fix them anymore. Getting older 
also has some unexplained side effects. Your cells will make fewer and fewer chaperones, thus leaving you with a lower capacity to fold proteins. These misfolded proteins can do worse than just having the wrong function. In fact, they can latch onto normal proteins and corrupt them into misfolded proteins. In fact, this proliferation mechanism can be seen in diseases such as the mad cow disease. These are so severe that cells have one of two ways to deal with it. They can either degrade the aberrant completely, or if they're not recognized, they will just aggregate. So the cell can just lump these together. But sometimes these mechanisms work all too well. So we have the opposite issue. Sometimes we degrade too many proteins. This is how we have diseases such as cystic fibrosis. It affects the pumps on the surface of cells that secrete liquids such as mucus and digestive juices. By means of mutations or just plainly bad protein folding, the pump that pumps water out gets sent to immediate degradation. But without these pumps at all, the water of the liquids that are supposed to lubricate these tubes thicken up. In fact, it can get so thick that it plugs all of these important tubes. So now there is hope uh, for people that have cystic fibrosis. There are drugs that can have a similar functions than a chaperone proteins. We are calling them correctors. And so they help the proteins to go back to their normal shape so that they are not rapidly degraded by the cells, similar to the buffering effect that I was talking earlier. And so now by adding that drug, adding the corrector drugs, there is enough of the uh, CFTR, uh, the proteins that is affected in cyst uh, cystic uh, fibrosis that can be expressed in the cell surface and pump the water uh, uh, adequately, allowing now the patients to have a more normal life. As you can see, protein folding is a highly important process that can be the difference between a functioning workhorse of the cell and a destructive disease. But how do we know what sequence of protein corresponds to what structure? Next time, we'll be delving into how AlphaFold works and the story of the uncredited inventor behind one of the most important algorithms that kick-started AlphaFold. Stay tuned and subscribe. Special thanks to Professor Mayer for helping and scripting the creation of this video. All of his works and others referenced in the video are in the description. For behind the scenes, please check out my Patreon links below. See you soon.